So far, we have seen how the upbringing and early experiences of Aurangzeb and Darashuko led to their divergent personalities. These personalities, although contrasting, had not yet clashed. Their paths, however, were to cross at an unlikely place. At the farthest fortress of the Mughal Empire, Kandahar. In this chapter, we will see how this nearly impregnable citadel led to shaping the dynamics of relationships between Shah Jahan and his two sons. Aurangzeb and Dara Shuko is an eight-part series. It is a crowdfunding project and hence we need your help to complete it. In 2024, apart from finishing this series, we aim to make a poetic one on ancient Tamil Sangam literature. We will also continue uncovering hidden histories from the post-Mauryan era and we also plan to introduce a few more philosophies of India to the fore. You can be a part of these projects. Please visit glimpsesanimations.com by clicking the link in the video description and consider contributing to the endeavor of bringing ages old Indian stories in modern animation format. The province of Kandahar, now in Afghanistan, was a matter of constant strife between the Mughal and Safavid Persian empires. The strategic location along the trade routes connecting India, Central Asia and the Middle East made it an extremely prized province for both empires. And hence, for decades, its possession oscillated between them. In 1638, where we last left our story, Kandahar was under the Mughals. But during that winter, Shah Jahan's spies reported to him that the Shah of Persia was preparing to capture it. Dara, who had been militarily close to inactive so far, saw this as an opportunity to prove his mettle on the battlefield and requested the emperor to make him in charge of Kandahar's defense. Thus, Dara was made the head of a powerful army and was sent to meet the threat. Soldiers and mercenaries with elephants, camels and horses from across the Mughal Empire marched along the narrow mountainous passes toward the city of Kandahar. But along with them, Dara had also taken with him mystics and oracles. He believed in their word as much, or perhaps more, than the seasoned commanders accompanying him. After reaching Kabul, a Mughal stronghold of the time, Dara encamped his army and sent only a small contingent ahead to Kandahar to observe and report the movement of Persians. Days and days passed. But the scouts did not return with any news. Baba, I'm getting anxious. The scouts haven't returned yet. Will we succeed in the campaign? Trust in the doing of God, Dara. And be patient. Things will surely turn out in your favor. The stars have spoken to me. The time is indeed auspicious for the empire. But is it for me, Baba? Is it for this campaign of mine? Your Honor, this messenger has returned from Kandahar with reports. What took you so long? Now speak immediately. Apologies for the delay, Shahzadeh. We found no Persian troops anywhere near Kandahar. This was surprising 
and so we stayed longer to gather more details and hence got uh, delayed we then learned with ascertainment that in the previous weeks the persian empire was attacked by the ottomans from the west and hence the shah of persia was forced to summon all his military strength from across the empire to meet this dire threat and hence the garrison at the western frontier is lying vacated and it's now impossible that persians would attack kandahar anytime soon subhan allah subhan allah indeed the almighty has a special grace for you dara he rewards you with this victory for you are close to him glory be to god glory be to god dara was filled with many emotions he was elated and surprised by such a fortunate turn of events but was also a little disappointed to have missed a chance to prove himself in battle but above all he was curious dara believed greatly in the words of mystics and holy men was this really a miracle a reward from the heavens for his spiritual studies practices and loyalty towards his masters dara did not have to wait too long to get an answer within 4 years the shah of persia managed to oust the ottomans in the west of his empire and focus immediately shifted eastwards this time he was personally leading a large army to take kandahar dara was sent again to counter the persians but just when dara crossed the indus again he received shocking news shah of persia only 31 years of age had died on his way and his gigantic army suddenly without a leader was sorrowful and clueless about their next move the persians were not attacking kandahar yet again dara was shocked by the bizarre news he could not see the two consecutive events as coincidental dara was now sure that owing to his devotion god was favoring him exceptionally dara's faith now cemented further drew him deeper into his studies and authorship with a greater fervor in the following years he would go on to write risala e haknuma a tract on sufi practices tariqat e haqiqat a treatise on spiritual journey hasanat al arifin a forisms of the saints and divani dara shiko a collection of poems in his poems we can see how amplified his devotion to his qadiriya sufi master had become as my lord and master is the peer his place is my khaba whoever sees him doesn't seek the khaba by equating with kaaba the holiest site in islam dara shuko elevated his master to divinity meanwhile the matter of kandahar remained far from settled in 1648 the newly enthroned shah of persia just 16 years old waged a very reckless siege of the kandahar fortress and surprisingly managed to capture it aurangzeb who had recently campaigned into the nearby region in balk and was in multan at the time was immediately sent with seasoned generals and 50000 men to recapture the fort and restore mughal prestige However, Aurangzeb lacked time. The mountainous way back from Kandahar to Kabul would be blocked by snow in the winter. Aurangzeb had to either capture the fort or retreat back home before the setting of winter. Aurangzeb tried everything he could to seize the city of Kandahar, 
scaling its wall, digging tunnels under the moat circling them. But the Persians had large cannons and a huge stockpile of gunpowder which thwarted all his attempts. It didn't take time for him to realize that the fort could only be taken by using big cannons which the Mughals had none. On Shah Jahan's order, Aurangzeb retreated back into India. The pride of the Mughals did not allow them to let go of the province so easily. For three long years, Shah Jahan made an enormous investment to raise for Aurangzeb a gigantic force of 60,000 men, 10,000 of which were musketeers. Eight large cannons were cast specifically to breach the fort walls. 20 smaller cannons and 120 other big guns were also dispatched. Shah Jahan himself decided to camp at Kabul to continuously instruct Aurangzeb and to be ready with a massive reserve of 50,000 men to reinforce him if needed. Shah Jahan was extremely confident that this time, Kandahar would fall. All the grand preparations, however, had one flaw. The excellent artillery that the Mughals had carried with them was not familiar to its operators. Not only did they fail to produce any dent in the fort walls, but some of them overfed two of the big guns with excessive gunpowder, causing them to burst and go useless. Aurangzeb again, failed to breach the Persian defense. Shahzadeh, we have received orders from the Emperor. Read it aloud. I hope he has some counsel for us to help us take the fort. Shahzadeh, uh, Jahapana has asked us to retreat immediately. What? Yes, Shahzadeh. He states that the road between Kabul and Kandahar is being attacked by a great force of Turkic tribes from the north. If they succeed, the men at Kandahar face a risk of getting trapped here for the winter. No, we cannot return. Not without taking the fortress. Write down the response to the letter. Aurangzeb knew that to leave Kandahar untaken after such grand preparations would destroy his reputation forever. He pleaded hard for a short delay. He even offered to lead a desperate all-in assault on the walls. But Shah Jahan did not concede. He replied to Aurangzeb with a note that clearly expressed disappointment. I greatly wonder how you could not capture the fort in spite of such vast preparations? Aurangzeb protested. I did my utmost, but the siege ammunition and the artillery were not enough for the endeavor. I am not going to give up Kandahar. I shall try every means to recover it, but I will assign the task not to you. The prince pleaded hard to keep him involved in any future Kandahar expedition. If you wish to make another attempt to acquire Kandahar, please let me be a part of it. I am ready to act even as a subordinate to whoever you would make in charge of it. But I will not return from Kandahar defeated. If I had believed you to be capable of taking Kandahar, I should not have recalled your army. Every man can perform some work. <sighs> it is a wise saying that men of experience need no instruction. One who has an ounce of sense knows his own good from his harm. And knowing how displeased towards me you would be at failing to fulfill your desire of taking Kandahar, would I fail purposefully? Aurangzeb was not given another chance and was again sent to Deccan to be its viceroy and to lead the next siege of Kandahar 
Dara was made commander. Dara did not have the experience of leading an expedition. He underestimated the odds and difficulties against him and overconfidently vowed to capture the fort within a week. He set off to Kandahar with an army even larger than the last one that accompanied Aurangzeb. 80,000 men and an artillery superior even to Aurangzeb's, this time with European gunners, known for their superior skills, marched with Dara. And so did the mystics and astrologers in whom he believed quite excessively. But unlike the previous marches, this time luck did not favor Dara. He lacked the experience needed for such an important and difficult mission. His leadership was marked by poor tactical decisions, mishandling of his generals and troops, inability to assess situations, delays and bad decision-making due to over-reliance on soothsayers, magicians and yogis. For five months, he battled the walls of Kandahar fort with cannonballs, men and beasts, but without any breakthrough. And as the winter approached, Shah Jahan, concerned about his troops, and especially his dear son, ordered a retreat. On his way back, Dara halted in Lahore for three weeks. He was too ashamed to face his father. Throughout his stay, and even as he trudged toward Delhi, he was full of questions. How would I, a defeated prince, face my father? Will he be as angry towards me, just as he was towards Aurangzeb? <sighs> Why did not God bring me victory this time? But, to his surprise, Shah Jahan was far from furious. On the contrary, he had arranged for a grand public reception for Dara's arrival. Honours, promotions and rewards were bestowed on Dara and his generals for their efforts. When Aurangzeb, serving in Deccan at the time, heard of such a celebration, it stung him bitterly. Even though both the princes had failed at taking the Kandahar, and Dara, far worse, with better preparations and resources, why was Aurangzeb criticized and taunted so harshly? And Dara, rewarded and praised so lovingly? Thus, the campaigns of Kandahar brought Shah Jahan's discord with Aurangzeb and his protective and affectionate closeness with Dara to the fore. In the next chapter, we will see how the familial tensions between the three grew rapidly to transform into a full-blown political crisis that engulfed the whole of the Mughal Empire. In the next part, we shall see Dara's interest expanding beyond Islam and into the realm of other faiths. But as one would expect, Aurangzeb was not pleased by this. What would Aurangzeb do to stop his brother? And how would Dara handle the new enemies? These questions will be addressed in the next part of Aurangzeb and Dara Shugo.